Okay. Today, I'll be telling you all about the bonus marks. It's a very exciting class we've got in store today. <laughs> we'll see if you find it exciting, but I don't know. Um, so lots of stuff happening, of course. Um, life is changing. Life is getting boring as hell and really kind of interesting. Um, but what I'd like to start off with, if, if anybody has any fun or weird food stories that they'd like to share uh, as of this time of isolation, strange shopping, online deliveries, uh, no more restaurants and bars, so much has changed in our food world. Um, I think I talked about this last week, how much not moving around has really, really shifted the way we will be consuming food for the next however many weeks or months or whatever. And so there's something kind of interesting, again, about probing this situation for understanding about how our food systems work. So my example, and I will then invite you to share yours if you have any, <clears throat> is because I've got now so much food in my refrigerator because I'm only shopping, say, once a week or once every week and a half, um, I have a lot more food in my fridge than I usually do. Usually I would buy food every two days and I've got lots of small food stores around me so I can do that easily. But because I'm now going out, buying a lot of food and putting it in my fridge or on my shelves, I'm not as in control over what I've got in there as before. And I've got quite a small refrigerator so it's hard to see to the back. And I don't always remember and because I'm eating a lot of you know, basically I'm, I'm making a bunch of food, having leftovers and then eating it up. I sometimes forget what's in there. So I want to be sure that I wasn't losing things at the back of my refrigerator, that I wasn't wasting any food, and that if there was something interesting back there, I should be eating it because now is the time to eat interesting things. <clears throat> and of course, what I found was, ha, my sourdough starter for my bread, which I haven't used in a very long time. And I, found, I have two jars of it. And it was given to me by... Uh, an old friend. And so I really want to protect it. It's been being used for now maybe about 25 years. So it's a it's an old starter. It's it's good. Uh, but I don't make bread that often. So it's been sitting there. You know, it looked a little sad. But, you know, sourdough yeast is pretty powerful stuff. So I pulled it out um, to see whether I could bring it back to life with some new flour. Um, and I've got two jars. So in case one of them gets a mold infection or something, I still have the other one. So I did... In one bowl, I used uh, pastry flour, and in the other bowl, I used regular white all-purpose flour. And I looked at the pastry flour, and I thought, oh, damn, it's got chlorine in it. It's been bleached, but it's actually got chlorine as one of the ingredients. And chlorine is terrible for yeast. So I got But anyway, it turns out that that starter bubbled up even faster than the one with the regular flour. So I guess the lower protein content, higher starch content, anyway, was useful. <clears throat> so. This is my strange, so this, I don't know if this will be visible, but there you go. There is my sourdough bubbling away. I'm going to make bread with it today. I've got two bowls that look like this. I've been feeding it for three days to bring it back to a healthy life. But so there you go. In the time of COVID, when viruses are terrifying us, we've also got very beneficial microbes in the form of yeast. Anyway, I've got beneficial microbes in the form of yeast bubbling away in my kitchen. Anyone else have uh, a story that they'd like to share or uh, an interesting food item that they found in their refrigerator or that they discovered they could buy online and have delivered to their house? Uh, someone else, please come up with an example of something maybe strange, maybe fun, maybe weird that um, has been happening in your world of food this week. Cereal <laughs> and water. Was that because you had no milk? Ah, uh, how did it taste? It tasted like cereal and water. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, yeah, it's important to still try to get out and get some of those things. There's lots of instructions online for how to shop safely. Basically, it's it's very likely that the virus doesn't survive well on food packaging. So it's still really safe to go out and go food grocery shopping. Um, and certainly it's not worth eating cereal with milk. I used to drink, eat cereal with orange juice. Then I discovered how many calories I was consuming. Yeah, an extra, a little bit of extra sugar is just, just the thing to make that breakfast cereal even more nutritious. Anyone else?
Oh, excellent. So you've got, uh, do you live in the city, Nicholas, that you can, or do you live somewhere where you've got an actual garden? Or do you growing stuff inside? Even better. Indoors. Awesome. And you've got enough light, I guess, for your seedlings to sprout. Good. Keep it up. Indoor gardens. So this is, you know, this is actually really interesting. It's this is pushing us to do things that we haven't done in the past. Like I'm, I'm getting my bread dough out. Nicholas is growing tomato seed from seeds. Um, we've got all sorts of new behaviors in terms of cooking at home, um, going out a lot less, all sorts of things that are changing. And it's kind of yes, it's a it's a really difficult time. But there's also some interesting things to be paying attention to. Awesome. Fresh herbs are, I think, the antidote to everything. I don't know. <laughs> I thought rosemary was the one thing that you can't kill. My rosemary always seems to just live and live and live. But yeah, so this is a, it's an opportunity to, to see what we can relearn to do. And I mean, all of you actually are dedicated to food in some way for the most part. Um, but it's uh, it's a time for everybody to be thinking about, yeah, how can I make my life more interesting through the things I can do rather than suffering with the things I can't do? Anyone else have a story about growing or eating or something strange that they found or something fun that they did? Nada. Okay, well, uh, there's going to be another opportunity to think about that, even if you don't want to say it out loud right now in class, um, because uh, so today, this week's in-class exercise, you'll actually do it after class, uh, but I'm going to ask you to sort of draw, not exactly a picture, but a, a concept map, and I'll show you an example, of um, your current food ecology or your current food system and how it's changed from before the time of the coronavirus. So it's gonna be about looking at the things that you used to do and then looking at what you do now and how that maybe has increased your sustainable footprint or decreased your sustainability in some way. Anyway, right, it'll be, I'll explain that later. It'll be uh, something that you can hand in at the end of the day. All right, so let us move forward of this class. As last week, um, we're compressing two weeks into one. So we're going to look at uh, food systems today and thinking about linear and circular or closed loop systems. And then we're also going to take a look at ethics. And both of these sections uh, will be useful for your checklist assignment. I'm going to start the class with a description of the checklist assignment again. So if you have questions about it, if you're confused about anything at all, um, this is the time to ask those questions. As a reminder, the checklist assignment is due at the beginning of next week's class. Um, and then next week, we will just focus on exam review. And the final week, week seven, uh, the week after that, is the exam itself, which we'll do during the class time. And I'll put announcements about that on Blackboard as well, which you should receive by email. So, um, so that's about it. I think so yeah okay that's the that's the preamble let's get into all the stuff yep uh yeah i'll talk about i'll talk about the checklist assignment and we will uh i don't have i'm not going to show you an example because i part of the assignment is actually to come up with the structure yourself but i will explain it as well as i can um, and the point is to for you to imagine the best format. So it's not about just me telling you and then you're copying that. You're about you're actually trying to figure out how you can create a checklist that is um, a, that is useful for you and useful for the business that you're imagining creating. Anyway, I'll get into that now. So onto the slides. Great. So the checklist assignment again. Read very carefully the full text of the explanation that is on Blackboard. Um, I've got it here as well, which I'll, I'll put it up in a sec. But it's really important to read everything because uh, very often uh, people don't read the full instructions and following the instructions is actually part of the assignments. You have to include everything that's asked for on that description and in the order that it's asked for so that it's clear to me that you've understood the assignment. But this is this is what you're going to do, and this is what I've said before, but I'll say it again. So 
for this assignment, the first thing you do, let me see if I can do something useful with shapes. So first thing that you do is pick a food business that you might like to open one day. So this may be, as I've said, it might be a food truck, could be a catering company, it could be a food delivery service, it could be any kind of food business that you think might be interesting to operate and that you can imagine the uh, implications of. So you can imagine what it might mean to run that food business. So don't pick something that you have no idea about. Pick something that you're interested in um, as a legitimate business. Could be a restaurant, could be a butcher shop, it could be a, a specialty tea shop, it could be anything you want. But it's something that has to uh, be real and also meaningful to you so that you're invested in the idea. So pick the business that you want to open. Then think about that business and what food products, and it's explicitly only food products, okay? Food products that you would need for that business. So what food products would you need for that business? And then what you're gonna do for the assignment is identify the categories of food products. So you're not actually listing every food product that that business would need. You're only gonna list the categories of food products. So my example has been a taco truck, a food truck, selling tacos. So you don't identify every kind of meat and every kind of cheese and every kind of salsa, but you do identify those top level categories. So for the example of the food truck, the categories would be carne, meat, uh, tortillas, salsas and condiments, beverages, and let's say vegetables, uh, and maybe a few others. But you're only picking the top level categories. So don't, if you're running a rest, if you're thinking about running a restaurant, you don't pick every single food item and you don't make a list of the menus and you don't look at all the specific ingredients. You're just picking those, le those top level categories. So in the case of the food truck, you've got those maybe five or six. In the case of a rent, you might have more categories because you're actually dealing with a wider range of, of uh, food items. In the case of a butcher shop though, which is just selling meat, for example, um, you would break the categories down. So you're not just gonna say meat, because that's only one category, but you might say pork, chicken, lamb, beef, whatever, game. And then you've got those as categories. So it, the categories will depend on your food business um, and they'll be specific to whatever you pick. So you actually have to understand the food business a little bit that you're picking in order to identify those categories, all right? Is that clear, the, the question, or is that not clear to anybody, what I mean by categories versus individual food products? Okay, cool. If it's not clear, ask me. Um, then, next step, for each category, you identify the different criteria, which is another word for standards, for measuring the sustainability of the food products within that category. So again, coming back to the food truck, um, uh, the, the taco truck, if I say I've got my categories are tortillas, meat, condiments, beverages, vegetables, then I want to identify the different standards for measuring the sustainability of each of those different categories. So for example, for meat, let's say we've got meat, um, what are the different uh, what are the different ways of measuring meat's sustainability? Well, we know that meat overall is one of the less sustainable food products in the world, and that's partly because it takes a lot of um, takes up a lot of water, takes up a lot of feed. It very often creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in the case of beef. Um, in the case of uh, pork and chickens, sometimes it's questions of the way the animals are treated. We're going to look at animal ethics today, so that might be one of your sustainability criteria. So you might say, okay. And then, you know, there are other things. Is it local? Is it grass-fed? Is it organic? Are they using antibiotics? So a lot of these are the standards that we, as food people, think about generally. But you want to really think about specifically um, questions of sustainability. And so we've talked about different kinds of sustainability as well. There are things like environmental sustainability. So that would be something 
that where you would say, okay, well, greenhouse gas emissions are a big problem, it comes from cows eating a lot of corn rather than eating grass. So if I care about environmental sustainability for this particular assignment, I might say I'm only gonna buy grass-fed beef because it produces less methane. Or I might be saying I'm only gonna produce, I'm only gonna buy local beef because it means that it's transported less distance and that means there's less CO2 and carbon monoxide emissions coming from the transportation of that. So those are two environmental concerns. But if I wanted to talk about, say, another category, tortillas, again, I might think about, are they being locally made? Well, if they're being locally made, that's going to reduce the carbon footprint. Good. But what kind of corn are they being made from? Are they being made from some heritage variety that tortillas were historically made from? Or are they being made with a hybrid that's grown in Canada? Do I care about that? Do I care whether it's genetically modified corn or do I want non-genetically modified corn? Do I want to think about, well, maybe it's more sustainable culturally to have someone with Mexican heritage or Latin American heritage making the tortillas, in which case this, they're a little bit more um, authentic, they're a little bit more culturally sustainable. Well, am I going to find a person with Mexican heritage using non-genetically modified corn in Toronto to make these tortillas? So these are these questions that you're asking yourself and then identifying the different criteria. So for the tortillas, GMO, yes, no. Local, yes, no. Or maybe it's not just a question of local, but how local? In Toronto? or in the greater Toronto area, or in Ontario, or in Canada. So you could have for each criteria um, just a yes or no answer, kind of black or white decision making, but you could also have make it based on a number of points. So you could say, if it's in Toronto, that's 10 points. If it's in Ontario, that's five points. If it's in Canada, it's two points. And then you use a point system for measuring your uh, your criteria and then you can add up those points and just do it mathematically some people in the past have done a sort of color-coded system where you've got red for absolutely not green for yes that's great and then yellow for somewhere in between so that you've got a kind of stoplight system like mm, bad good somewhere in between so that's a bit like just a three-point system but the the idea here is that you come up with the way you evaluate um, and you have to come up with the categories and then the criteria and then the way that you measure those criteria. So is it going to be points, yes, no, some other system? And that's up to you to decide. So once you've identified your categories, you identify the criteria for each category, and then total for the whole checklist, you need at least 40 different criteria. So 40 different standards of measuring sustainability. So they have to be different. You can't have local meat, local tortillas, local beverages, local vegetables, local cheese. You have to actually have different criteria for each of your different categories. And then you need a total of minimum 40 of those criteria. So for example, if with my taco truck, I've got five different categories. That means about eight different criteria per category. So eight criteria about how the meat is more sustainable. Eight criteria about the tortillas, eight to criteria about the vegetables. That's just because five times eight is 40. Um, you could also have three about the meat and 15 about the tortillas. It depends how you want to weigh the different criteria. But basically, you're taking your categories, you're dividing 40 by that number, and then you've got that number of criteria for each category. So that's the basic structure. So that's the, just the checklist. Once you've done all that, Let's go and look at the, uh, the actual assignment. And zoom. Okay. So once you've done that, that's this whole section here. Come on. Okay, so you've done your checklist, and now you need to complete the rest of the assignment. So, next thing you do is describe sustainability in your own words. Okay, this is really important because I don't want you to just cut and paste from Wikipedia or cut and paste from one of the slides. 
I want you to think about what sustainability now means to you and then describe that. Just a couple of sentences. We've had some examples, but I really want to hear it coming out of your voice and not cut and paste from somewhere else. If you do cut and paste from somewhere else, remember you have to cite that content. You have to have a reference for it. You can't just pretend that you came up with a quote that's on Wikipedia. Um, so if you, if you don't cite it, that's a case of plagiarism and that's really dangerous. So make sure that you do it in your own words. If you borrow anyone else's words, you absolutely have to cite it. So you've described sustainable in your own words. Now name your business and explain what your mission statement is. And last week we looked at a bunch of mission statements. There are examples for you in the slides. But I want you to write up, again, in your own words, a mission statement for your business that reflects your commitment to sustainability. Why you think sustainability is important. That may be linked to the description that you've come up with yourself. So you're going to describe sustainability in your own words and then write a mission statement that explains why that's important for your business. Okay. In this section, you also describe the structure of your checklist. Oops, that's a little bit messy. So you describe your checklist and explain why you've designed it this way. So if you used a point system, explain that maybe sustainability is not black and white. Sustainability has a lot of different factors involved. Sustainability is a complex issue that needs different ways of evaluating it. So it depends how you how, depending on how you've created your checklist, your description will be different. Okay, so that's just the introduction. Maybe about 100 words. It's not a big part of the assignment. Don't spend too much time there. The big chunk, obviously, is the checklist. So you've created your checklist, presumably, already. Now you need to show it. So you can show it in the form of a table. You can show it in the form of a grid. You can just for show it in the form of a list of words. But you want me to be able to understand how you've built it and what the different categories are, and then what the different criteria are for each category. And remember, again, you need to have at least 40 criteria for your whole checklist. All right. All right, next step. So that's worth 40%. That's the big chunk of this assignment. The next step is the justification of your criteria. So for each of those criteria on your checklist, you have to give you know, a one sentence or even just a, a half a sentence reason or rationale for including it in your checklist. So if you say, for example, one of my criteria for my meat is that I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna sell grass-fed beef. Okay, why? Why is grass-fed beef more sustainable? And we've talked about this in a number of times, but grass-fed beef is more sustainable because corn is not a really good feed for cows. It makes them grow quickly, but it actually has a lot of methane. It produces a lot of E. coli, and it's not what cows are designed to eat. They're actually designed to eat grass. So it's more appropriate for the cows, but it's also producing less greenhouse gas, and it's also producing less E. coli in the world. So that's more sustainable. So there you've got a justification for that criterion of grass-fed beef. Remember that you've got lots of ways to justify uh, different kinds of sustainability. You've got the four P's of sustainability and the three pillars. Those are talked about in the very first class. So the four P's, what are they? Planet, people, profit, policy. How can you connect your criteria on your checklist to one of those P's? And then the three pillars of environment, society, culture. There are actually a bunch of pillars. There's economics as well. Um, so you want to name the reason for each of your criteria. And it doesn't need to be super long. It could be one sentence. You could do this also in a grid or in a table. So you've got checklist, category number one, criteria one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, justification, 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 justification. So that way I can see exactly what the justification is for each of your criteria. Um, again, if you are justifying it with research or from with sources from other places in the world, you need to correctly cite your research in text with one of those tag citations that I showed you, and also include the reference at the end of the assignment so that I can see exactly where that information comes from. Okay. Then, next step. 
final step is to use your checklist to evaluate two similar food products from a single category. So coming back to my example of the taco truck, say I've got two different kinds of tortillas, tortillas that are made in Guadalajara in Mexico from uh, GMO corn and tortillas that are made in Toronto uh, or in Mississauga, let's say, from heritage variety corn, but by a non-Mexican person. So then you've got two similar food products. They're both tortillas, but they have different qualities to them. And then you use your checklist to evaluate which one you think is more sustainable. What are the trade-offs? What are the positives? What are the negatives? And ultimately, which one of those products would you choose for your food business? So this is the chance to show that your checklist is actually useful in doing what it's supposed to do. So again, you might want to do some research on the two products, understand the company's policy, or understand the company's values and ethics. Um, you might talk about their price, anything. Anything that you can find out about those products um, will help you then evaluate the sustainability. So a couple of examples here, you can't use those examples because you have to come up with your own and because your business will be maybe different from, from what these examples represent. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of how to compare two similar products. Remember, the product to be similar, you can't pick tomatoes and tortillas, because those are not similar products, and you won't learn anything by evaluating them using your checklist. So that's a summary, once again. Um, as a reminder, in the PDF of this, uh, this assignment description, there are a bunch of different questions that you should use as a self-check after doing the assignment to make sure that you've done everything that the assignment requires. Did you define or describe sustainability in your own words? Did you actually introduce your checklist and explain why you designed it that way? So this is just a, a useful guide after having done your assignment to make sure you've done everything correctly. Okay. Any questions? I'll pause dramatically to drink some water. Any questions? No question. No, all clear. What's that? No questions, all clear. All clear, great, thank you. Yes, and the due date is uh, not April 7th, but April 9th. Does it say April 7th somewhere? No, April 9th, yeah. No worries. Uh, yeah, so next, uh, so it's at, at the beginning, well, before class begins, so by 9 o'clock next Thursday, April 9th. And that is that. <clears throat> All right, so we'll have a lot of, there's a lot of content in today's class that you can use as resources for, uh, for doing this assignment. So pay attention every time I say, hey, here's a resource for you to use. All right, on with the class. And again, if you have questions, if questions come up between now and uh, next Thursday, let me know. Just don't ask me a question on Wednesday night at 10 o'clock, because I probably won't read it before. All right, um, so right away also in this in this set of slides, but also on Blackboard, this was these are some slides that we didn't really look at last week, but um, they're there as resources for you. These are on this page and the following page. Um, the Sustainable Restaurant Organization, the University of Guelph Sustainable Restaurant Group, the Vancouver Island Green Business Certification, and then on the next page, Relay, which is a restaurant in Denmark, uh, the Leaders in Environmentally Accountable Food Service, Feast on Ontario, and Wasted. These are all different websites that talk about sustainability in food businesses. So they're really useful resources for you right now to look at what other organizations are doing to create the standards that they think are appropriate for sustainable food practices. So these are all um, there. I will leave them in there. Well, they're in, the, they're in the slides, so take a look at them. Super useful. If you're getting stuck and trying to imagine what else can I say about sustainability, these are the perfect place to go. But in fact, every, every class we've done, there have been different tools that you can use for this assignment. 
So keep coming back to the PowerPoint slides if you're confused about you know, what other kinds of sustainability can I think about. Remember, there are many kinds of sustainability, as you showed me in your last quiz from last week. <coughs> All right, um, onward. So coming back to the, uh, the bonus points exercise, as you will recall, uh, if you were here in class, you were supposed to decide whether or not you were going to be uh, take your fair share, that is 2%, or whether you wanted to try to be sneaky and ask for more than your fair share, 6%, or if you were going to be strategic and ask for 0% so that one of those people who picked six got bumped off. Um, so the, the rules were if more than 10% of the class chose 6%, no one would get a bonus mark. And if less than 10% of the class chose 6%, then you would get the bonus marks that you asked for. Um, that would be unless you'd picked six and someone else chose zero and you got bumped off by them. So I'm not going to tell you who chose what, but here are the results. Drum roll. So very exciting, I'm sure. In our class, this one, one person chose zero. 12 people chose two, and six of you greedy people chose 6%. And because of the rules, that meant that that, uh, that one person who chose zero bumped off one of the people who chose six, leaving us with five people who chose six. The class was uh, 30 people in all, and so that means more than 10% of the class chose six, which, as Matthew says, means no one's getting any bonus points from this particular exercise. Sorry to say. You may be interested to know that in the other class, um, the uh, hospitality class, those are the numbers there. So we only have 10 people in that class, uh, and only one of them chose six, which would have actually meant that everybody got their points, but one other person chose zero. So it ended up meaning that eight people got 2% and two people got 0%. Well, life isn't fair because, because mostly because people aren't fair. And I think that's the thing to learn here is that, um, yeah, it's always tempting to try to get a little bit more than you might deserve. But if you do that, you might end up not only screwing it up for yourself, but for others. And that's, that's really fundamentally the thing about sustainability is it's kind of, you have to be, you have to always be thinking about fairness, even if other people aren't being fair. And that sometimes you actually have to take a hit for the whole team in order for things to be fair. And so this is where it's kind of annoying because there will always be selfish people. There will always be people who want a little bit more um, and that's that's the way that humanity is. So there's not much to do about that. And greed is definitely very real. Um, you know, in this case, it's it's a sort of minor issue. A couple of points here, a couple of points there. Not the end of the world. But in the bigger world of sustainability, this is the big thing. And so when the big multinational companies are exploiting smaller places or places with uh, people who have lower incomes or they're exploiting the resources of another country, you know, that's taking more than they deserve. That's doing exactly what this exercise is show showing us. And that's what's, that's what's creating all the problems in the world is unbalanced, yeah, capitalism, but unbalanced capitalism. Capitalism itself isn't the worst thing. It's the capitalism that is unchecked and capitalism in which there's a belief that some group deserves more than the rest of us. So, all right, enough proselytizing about fairness. But uh, keep this one in mind because it's always it's always interesting to see what happens uh, in groups like this and whether I haven't done any statistical analysis of this, but sometimes smaller groups like the hospitality group with only ten students in it, there's more attention to fairness because if there are fewer of you. There's, you know, you can sort of see, you can, there's more trust maybe, but you can also sort of see where there might be some uh, bigger risk when there's a smaller number of people. In a big crowd, it's easy to forget about that stuff. So on we go. Sorry I didn't get bonus points, but uh, you, you, will, you will have another opportunity to get, uh, well, not bonus points, but your regular points at the end of the class. 
So just a very quick review of some of those terms from uh, the profit class last week. Uh, first of all, the concept of profit in the first place, which doesn't have to be contradictory to sustainability. The profit is total sales minus total expenses, and that's what's left over. That's the obvious form of profit. But if you think about profit in terms of a percentage of sales rather than a, an absolute figure, you can start thinking about how to increase the total sales while reducing the percentage, being more sustainable, maybe, making as much money as you would have if you'd been unsustainable. So profit and sustainability don't contradict each other. Um, you just have to think about, as that, that magazine headline said, profitability, sustainable profitability means profitability forever, maybe at a less high rate, but maybe at a more fair rate, and also in a way that doesn't damage the environment, hurt people, exploit other people, um, or turn off your customers because you're charging too much or you're giving too little. So profit is really, it's not that obvious, but it's... Uh, it is certainly possible to have sustainable profits and to make a profit while being sustainable. The next word here was externalities. Anyone remember a quick definition of what an externality is or an example of an externality? Uh, perhaps in the next bullet point down, there's an example of an externality. Da, da, da. So if you remember the Raj Patel uh, example of the, the real cost of a hamburger, he was saying that while the hamburger might cost four or five dollars, the hidden costs in that hamburger include things like the carbon footprint and the petroleum that's being put into the production of the beef and the burger and the, I mean, the beef and the bun and the tomato and the condiments. Um, the, the cost of healthcare, the cost of taking care of people who eat nothing but hamburgers all their lives or too many hamburgers or too much junk food in general. So externalities are everything that is not accounted for in the way that the system is described. It's things that aren't counted in the final accounting. So things like environmental waste or the exploitation of workers or you know lack of lack of uh, insurance for those workers or workers who are paid too little or environments that are being stripped of their resources at a very low cost so all of those things cost something they just don't cost the consumer or the producer of the food they cost the environment they cost the society they cost um, the future so this is this is the, the complications of the externalities we don't see them very easily and that's why they can be hidden so well from us in the final accounting and then <clears throat> uh, so true, true price of a burger this was this idea that, that i just described that raj patel explained to us and the final bit, policy is only as good as its enforcement. This, this idea that this is a policy question, not a profit question. But the policies, which we've described as sort of five steps, making a plan, writing that plan down, communicating that plan, and it's a plan to deal with an issue probably. Uh, so writing, making the plan, writing it down, uh, communicating it, and then enforcing it. You know, that's the real challenge. You can create as many policies as you want, but if there's no enforcement and nobody is following the policy, then the policy is useless. Um, so we're seeing examples of that right now as policies are created by the government about people staying home, about people not traveling, about people going into self-confinement after they've been traveling, about not meeting up in groups. All these policies can be put out into the world, but until you start policing them or enforcing them, um, they're not that useful. So right now in Quebec, People are starting to get tickets for having parties or the police are coming and there are arrests being made um, or people are being fined for doing stuff that are against the policy. So the enforcement is coming in this situation, but in a broader sense, how do you enforce uh, you know, the policy of sustainability? Well, it has to actually have something, some teeth to it, All right? So enforcement is the fourth step and then the fifth step was revising a policy so policies need to get changed over time as the context changes as the situation is written for changes so policy is many steps planning writing communicating enforcing 
revise them. All right, that's just a quick review. Today, a little history of food systems, um, thinking about how food and agriculture has evolved over time. And also we're gonna look quickly at um, how a food system might be a little bit more sustainable by being a closed loop system rather than a linear system. We're actually not gonna do the practice exercise, but you can think about how you would, how you would create your own food system. Um, and right now you've got a, a food system that you're living in, your apartment or your home, wherever you are living, uh, you've got uh, a little mini food system going on. So that's what the final exercise for today will be about. All right, a little inspiration, because we need some good cheer in our lives. Um, and this is, this is about you know, this problem of food waste and the fact that in not just uh, production, but in our consumer situations, we tend to pick fruits and vegetables that look pretty. We tend to pick meats and dairy that seems like it's been on the shelf for less long. We're trying to do the best for ourselves, but very often we make choices that are not sustainable because, uh, because we're going for aesthetics rather than the quality of the food as well. So ugly fruits and vegetables, if you, you've seen them in stores, but you don't see them very often. And that's because retailers know that we consumers tend to buy fruits and vegetables that look pretty and that don't look ugly. So a bunch of different uh, efforts have been made over time to address that issue in order to reduce um, the wastage of ugly fruits and vegetables. Um, and we don't see them in grocery stores because they simply don't make it into the retail chain for the most part. There's something like 8 to 30% of fruits and vegetables that never even leave the farm to come into the retail chain or the wholesale retail chain because the farmers know and the retailers and wholesalers know that we, the consumers, probably won't buy them at the end of the day and they'll just get wasted somewhere else. So there's no sense transporting them to the store if they're gonna get wasted. And so a lot of fruits and vegetables just are left to rot at the farm or they're composted, um, but they're not actually making it into the retail chain despite the fact that they're perfectly good food. So I'm gonna show you, um, I've got a video for you to look at first and then a couple of websites. And the video is uh, from a grocery chain in uh, France called Intermarché. And uh, they created a whole campaign that this, uh, this poster here that you see on screen, oops, there you go, that thing, is part of this campaign. So the video is in French, but I'll explain afterwards. You'll just get a sort of sense of what they're talking about. But you'll uh, you'll see that they're centering it all on this idea of fruits et légumes mush, and mush is a French sort of slang word for ugly, but it translates maybe a bit better as inglorious. So it's a very it's a silly word, but it's a word to to be playful about how ugly these fruits and vegetables are. And if you look at these different fruits and vegetables, they are indeed kind of weird looking, but also kind of beautiful because they represent what nature does all on its own. All right, so I'm going to cut and paste the YouTube link into the chat. Um, it's a relatively short video. How long is it? It's two and a half minutes long. So I'll give you three whole minutes to watch it, and then we'll come back, and I'll explain any of the, the French expressions that were not understood and uh, I will turn off my microphone and camera for this time and then come back and we'll chat again in three minutes.
So this campaign was uh, 2015, I believe. Um, <clears throat> what's uh, so they we noticed in the video, you may have noticed in the video, that in 2014 um, the UN declared it the year uh, uh, to to counter food waste, to work against food waste. Um, and so this in the supermarket chain in France uh, glamorized ugly fruit and vegetables. And so they made this campaign. I mean, you can see the photographs are very beautiful. Uh, they really, they picked some great examples of weird looking fruits and vegetables. And then they turned it into a positive. So they, uh, they created the separate section in the grocery store. They created the separate uh, advertising campaign, different names on the labels. They of course sold the fruits and vegetables for less money. And as the, the guy in the video said, the only problem was that they ran out of stock too quickly. But on average, in each store, they sold 1.2 tons of uh, fruits and vegetables within the first two days. Uh, they increased their profit margin by 24% in those stores for those fruits and vegetables. Uh, they raised the issue for consumers that eating ugly fruits and vegetables, imperfect fruits and vegetables, is a good idea, um, that it is against waste. They made soups and juices out of these things, so of course they could the consumers could tell that the food was just as good tasting as whether as from fruits and vegetables that look pretty. And then they get a ton of good public relations media coverage for this. So they became a hero in France for having taken action. And so of course it was very good for the stores overall, not just for selling ugly fruits and vegetables, but it showed that if you create a sustainable practice or a more sustainable practice, and then put the right package of message around it, you can actually change consumer's behavior and get media attention and have a success and something that succeeds for everybody. So this was the idea of this particular campaign. And I think it's one of the most, uh, the most effective ones. They were playful. They were, uh, they were thinking about changing consumer behavior with those product samples. And they were also uh, recognizing that it could, in the long term, be extremely beneficial for them because of the, of the good media results. Uh, so that's that's one example. There are a couple of other examples which I will just show you the, the websites for, and their their links are here from the these two food waste campaign and Misfits Produce. And I'll just show you these screens. So here's the Misfits Fruits and Vegetables. This is called Misfruit Products. This is a Canadian website. Um, but they're also talking about the importance of eating weird looking fruits and vegetables as a way to reduce waste. So um, this is talking about how much food is wasted annually in North America and then how we can get away from it. So of course, there's a TED Talk about it. Like everything, there's a TED Talk about and then they have these lovely examples of their weird looking fruits and vegetables which aren't actually that weird looking um, and if you grow your own fruits and vegetables you know that this is a perfectly standard part of every every garden and every tree so again you've got in-store examples where you can find the misfits this is actually just in the central part of uh, north america right now but it's a whole series of different efforts towards celebrating the weird looking fruits and vegetables of the world. Then there's uh, another one that I'll show you, which is, uh, this one. yes, so another website, this is also about food waste, I'm very focused on that, and they just call it ugly fruits and vegetables, and they're not, you know, they're not even ugly, they're just kind of weird. Um, but it's an effort to celebrate the bizarre, <laughs> the sometimes extremely bizarre looking different fruits and vegetables um, and to take maybe some pleasure in the idea that fruits and vegetables can look weird and still be delicious and even be maybe more fun because they are not standard shapes. So I like this a lot. There's a third link in here which uh, you can look at. It's actually not such an interesting video, but uh, Back to the slides. Oops. So this is another example of a woman in Portugal, Isabela Suarez, and fruta feia means just ugly fruit. 
but she was doing the same thing and except in her case it was it was about collecting the ugly fruits and vegetables and putting them in in a box uh, or in many different boxes and selling them back to people in a kind of box scheme like you might have in an urban uh, urban agriculture drop uh, so in her case, she's not selling them through grocery stores, she was just selling them direct to consumers. But it's the same idea about gathering up all of this, this, this food that would have otherwise been wasted and making it clear to people that it's perfectly good to eat. <clears throat> so, by a raise of hands, oh, sorry, before I go back, before I'm jumping off, uh, any comments on this? This is one of my favorite all-time sustainability campaigns, but, uh, what do you think? Who um, who among you, and here again, by a raise of by a show of hands, how many of you pick the nicer looking fruit or vegetable over the slightly weird looking one if you have a choice? So who opts for the pretty one versus the ugly one? Yeah, raise raise your hand, just pop your hands up using the little hand raising option. Okay, so 12 of you so far out of 24 have said that you would pick the prettier one over the ugly one. So great, if the rest of you are actually uh, buying the ugly fruits and vegetables, hooray! So maybe this is an option even um, as a sort of challenge to yourself when we go back into the grocery stores again, or if you're still going to the grocery stores, look for the uglier fruits and vegetables and buy them instead instead of letting them get thrown out and see whether or not you feel like a more powerful, sustainable eater in the world because you've made that choice. All right, <coughs> on to the next slide. Um, so this is, I want to look a little bit at the history of, of um, not just farming, but food in general, but just a quick, a quick poll again by raising your hand. How many of you were actually raised on a farm or with a very large garden, let's say. No one else? Just one person was raised on a farm or raised near a farm, with a farm, farm in the family? Okay. How about, uh, for those of you who know, how many of your parents were raised on a farm or with a very large kitchen garden. A few more. Yeah, okay, I would say mine were too. All right, so a whole lot more. Anyone know about their grandparents or their great-grandparents? Yeah, so even more. So, not surprising, uh, more of us in this generation, or your generation, my generation, were not raised on farms. Um, if you go back in time, more and more people would have been raised on farms or raised with agriculture as part of their life. That was a lot more normal in the past. Um, anyone have any guesses? So, thinking about how much of the population works in agriculture, I know the stats in North America, so I'll use that. Um, so how many, what percentage, all right, no, so I'll back up. Historically, before industrialization came to food production, so say 200 years ago and before, about 50%, five zero, of the population around the world worked in agriculture. So about half of all people, or half of the labor of all people, was focused on food production at the farming level. That's, you know, that seems sort of normal, like about half the people make raise food and the other half of them are, you know, doing other things to maybe make some money or to take care of the family or to do whatever. But agriculture used to occupy 50% of our collective labor. What do you think it is now in Canada 
and the United States. In North America, what percentage of the world is working in, or a percentage of people are working in farming? Any ideas, any guesses? Okay, so some of you think it's gone up from 50%, some of you think it's gone down. All right, so some people think it stayed about the same. All right, it's less than everybody has said so far. Less than 10%. More than 0.5%. <laughs> All right, so um, there you go. Zooming in on the number, it's um, uh, the guesses are coming in thick and fast. 1.2, Julian. Yeah, so in, in the United States, it's almost exactly 1.2. In Canada, it's probably about 1.9, closer to 2%, but really, really little. So what's happened? We used to spend roughly one out of every two people, or at least 50% of the labor of everybody in the world was directed at farming. Now it's 2% on average around the world. 2% uh, of the population producing, obviously, way more food because we have more people on the planet than we had 100 years ago. So there are 2% of the population, or 2% of human labor goes into agriculture versus 50% to make much more food. So what happened? Well, industrialization happened. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides, um, tractors and other petroleum-based tech technologies, irrigation, genetically modified food, all of these things radically increasing productivity, but also radically shifting labor from human labor onto mechanical labor, so onto tractors and onto all the other things, but also onto chemicals. So the use of chemicals and petroleum products and all that comes with that, all the other technologies, are what has allowed far fewer people to work in agriculture. But it's also meant that all those people who wanted to do agriculture often got shifted off of their land because they couldn't afford to anymore because they were still just operating at the regular scale of a family farm. Family farms really just almost don't exist anymore. The vast majority of large-scale farm, uh, farming in industrialized places, I'm saying, is, is industrialized agriculture. It's large-scale, very human labor, uh, low-intensive, and mechanical labor, high-intensive. Now, there are lots of places around the world, um, particularly places like India, where small-scale farming still exists to a great extent. And so that's one of the important places to, to pay attention to in terms of sustainability, but also one of the places that's at a lot of risk of exploitation by large seed companies and large chemical companies who are trying to convert small scale farmers into more industrial production. So the shift in labor meant also that there's a shift in, in where people lived, because if you can't make money uh, in agriculture anymore, or if you're no longer working in agriculture because your labor has been replaced by a tractor, and you don't have an income anymore, you have to go somewhere else to make money. And there's more ways to make money in cities than there are in, in the countryside. And so that's why we've seen over the last hundred years this migration from the country city and why today around the world, more than 50% of the population lives in cities, um, somewhere like 60% of the population lives in cities, and far smaller number of people live in the countryside. It used to be sort of 20% lived in the cities and 80 in the country. And now that's shifting much more to where people living in the cities. And if you look at science fiction movies, which are very good at predicting what's about to happen, we see these planets that are entirely covered in cities and there are no, there's no more land left. And so this is where we have run the risk of, of destroying our countryside and making it so mechanized and industrial that nobody's really living there or taking care of it anymore. And so again, we come back to this idea of how indigenous food systems were about land stewardship and taking care of the place because you actually lived there and you got your food from there and you were part of the countryside, you're part of the land. Um, and now we've just left that land to be taken care of by people who don't really care about it in the same way. And that's where we end up with all of this industrial exploitation and the problems with chemicals and the problems with petroleum products and the problems with water usage and everything else that comes from it.
So this is all part of what we call the food system, which is what we're trying to look at today in a, in a holistic sense. So this illustration here on screen shows how many different elements um, go into a food system. And the food systems are very, what we call complex systems. They're made up of a lot of different drivers, a lot of different things that change how that system behaves. Um, and then also a lot of different actors or activities, that is the people and the businesses or organizations that work in food systems. So in this slide, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so we can see it more clearly. So I'll go start with the food system activities and actors. <clears throat> and so these are things like pre-production, which is like seed saving and the, produ the production of uh, chemical inputs and other mechanical inputs. There's production, which is actually the farming part, which is when you're actually in the field growing something, either an animal or a plant. Post-production is shipping and transformation and uh, processing. And then consumption, which is what we average human beings do, which is purchase and cook and eat the food, and then waste and disposal. Waste and disposal. And so this is very similar to that production chain that we saw in the story of stuff in the very first video from the very first class. Um, and that's this process of basically extraction through to transformation, through to consumption, and then ultimately waste or trashing at the end. So those are some of the activities that go on. But then some of the things, what we call the drivers of food systems, are the less obvious elements, but that are still part of food systems. And that includes things like infrastructure. So that's technologies and equipment and farming, society and culture, which is, so infrastructure also includes roads and transportation systems. Society and culture is us, how we think about food, what we want to eat, how we practice food, how we work together profit and shared prosperity, politics and policy, so policies are always part of food systems as well, research and development, natural forms of energy and other energy inputs, so the sun, that's an important part of it, um, but also, um, oh, what else do we put in? Sorry, electricity, uh, petroleum, all those things. Biophysics and the environment, so this is more like water, soil, and air. Those are part of the food system, even though they're not food themselves. Obviously the economy, very much uh, a driver of the food system. And then power and equity and sharing and fairness and exploitation, all those questions around power. And demographics, how humans are and who they are, all of these. So then those drivers plus those activities create a bunch of outcomes. And the outcomes are all listed here in the center which you can't see very well when I'm using blue ink. So here are the outcomes. And these are the things that we are talking about in this course. So resilience and equity and sustainability, stability, productivity, health, profit, well-being, security. Those are all the outcomes of a food system. It's not just nutrition or taste, but all of the things that a food system produces. And so a food system does produce sustainability, but also requires sustainability. And a food system produces profit, and a food system can produce health or illness. All of those things are part of the outcomes of a food system. The food system is a really large scale uh, concept, and trying to understand how to make the whole system sustainable is what a lot of people are working on right now in food research. But it's not it's not clear and it's not obvious because, as you can see, there's so many different elements, so many different people, so many different drivers. And so making the whole system sustainable is really challenging. So I'm gonna take a break in a couple of minutes, but just uh, to understand food systems in words, if you think about a food system, it goes beyond just food and agriculture. Um, yes, those are some of the major elements of a food system, obviously. But if you think about first just what food is, so it's a substance that we eat or drink, it's what we put into our bodies. We don't just put plants and animals into our bodies, we put processed plants and animals into our bodies. And then agriculture is the system based on the land of producing plants and animals that then get turned into food. So this may seem obvious, but it means when you think about that, land 
production processes, transformation processes, um, and then turning it into products that we then go and buy somewhere, that starts to make you understand a bit more how broad a food system is and why it's what we would say an entire web of processes that are involved in making food. It's not just um, a linear production chain. Those are some words to describe food systems. Here's another graphic that maybe helps to understand food systems in a different way. And again, it looks a lot like one of those graphics from Annie Leonard's video, The Story of Stuff. But there's this, so this is a, a quote here from this chapter, I think it's actually a book, The Complexity Approach to Food Systems. Understanding food systems are complex, they're not straightforward or simple or linear. And um, we can then understand them as a, as a value chain or a network or a web of different behaviors and that they all feed into each other. No pun intended. Um, and so what's interesting with a, with a graphic like this, this one on the side here, is where do you start? Maybe you don't start anywhere, you just jump in. So let's jump in at consumption, which is what most of us do on a regular basis. And we recognize that consumption invariably leads to some kind of disposal, whether it's wasted food or wasted packaging. Um, but that has to go somewhere, all that waste. And is it going right back into food production? No, but it is going into the environment where food production is taking place. So although we, our food might be going into a compost bin and then into a industrial composter, it might also be going to a landfill. And then the landfill is probably not that far from the farm or the ranch where our food is being produced. Food production leads to aggregation and distribution. So that's transportation and shipping and then processing in food factories or in, in uh, packaging facilities. It goes into marketing retail. It goes to us where we then prepare it in some way and then it goes back to consumption. So you see how all of these different elements of the food system are connected. And that's why taking action in one has an effect somewhere else. We talked about that a bit last week. So this is, an, again, a more text version of some of these inputs and outputs. All of these different resources, from natural resources to human resources, go into food production, generating, basically, what we're all trying to do is feed humans. So it's the nourishment of humans. And there are lots of examples of inputs and outputs. We've already seen them in some of the previous slides. All right, we're going to come back to this. Let's take a break now, 10-minute uh, break. Uh, I've got 10.14 uh, on my clock, so 10.24. Okay, I will answer that question that just came in uh, during the break. But in the meantime, I'm going to turn off my uh, sound and microphone to conserve bandwidth, and we will regroup in 10 minutes to talk about scales of food systems.
<clears throat> okay, gonna get going again. And continue on with this idea of <clears throat> different scales of food systems. So we talk about food systems and it's it's you know it's a very broad abstract idea. But if you think about it in terms of different scales, um, it can help understand them better. So you might, and we talk often about the importance of small scale. Small scale, you can imagine it as maybe a self-sufficient farm, um, a family farm. And that exists in some places, and it's existing much less in Canada these days. But you could even almost consider an individual human being to be a food system as well. Like I am a food system, you are food systems because we also have inputs and outputs, they're drivers, they're things that we care about. Um, so in some ways a human being is a food system, but that's not really what we mean when we talk about food systems. At a larger scale though, you could talk about a corporate farm or a farm, a collection of farms, a farm system. And those are farms that are generally producing not raw food to eat like apples and grapes and wheat and well, wheat maybe, uh, apples and grapes and things that human beings eat, but they're often producing food at such a large scale that it's going into what we call the, the commodity market. And commodities are things like grains and oil and all the foods that are processed into other foods. So wheat, corn, soy, rice are commodities. Uh, grain, um, oil seeds are commodities. Uh, beef has become kind of a commodity. Sugar is a commodity. A lot of these things that are foods that are processed into other foods are commodities. And that's at the bigger scale of a corporate farm or a, a large uh, industrial scale farm. And then at the much larger scale, the global food systems is everything. So that's all the supply chains, all of the trading systems, all of the distribution, all the consumers, and all of the things that connect us as, as nations and corporations. So food systems are in some ways systems of other systems, many different systems within them. And they're also what we call open systems in that they are dependent on and operate inside of all the other systems of the world. So food systems interact with ecological systems because that's where our food comes from. Food systems interact with ec economic systems because that's how food is bought and sold. But also all the technology systems, all the systems of culture and society. These are systems of systems of systems and food is one of them. So that's why, again, it's complicated to try to just make change within the food systems because they're also dependent on and embedded within all these other systems around the world. So change here also has to have happen over there in some ways to make the change actually stick. So this is another interpretation of a food system as a com what we call a community food system. And that's, uh, I'm just gonna try to find another pen color to use. Um, a community food system involves other things that aren't present in a regular agricultural food system. And the things to look at and pay attention to on this slide are things like learning together and being engaged. So in the community food system, we the consumers are also participating sometimes in production or in processing. We're thinking about local food economies, buying locally, which supports ultimately ourselves and our own communities by keeping the money in the local system rather than having it go to a corporation that operates at a much larger scale and at the international level. So community food systems also pay attention to some of these other more social issues, but also environmental issues, also sustainable issues, um, also um, responsibility to the local place and being part of say a province or a city or a country rather than just thinking about food as being an international kind of globally available product. So the community system then adds those layers. All right, looking at uh, food systems over time, <clears throat> very, very simply, again, this is a bit like the very first class where we had where I was just going through the, the main points. And we talked about this a little bit. We started as human beings anyway, started as hunter gatherers. We weren't doing 
domesticated agriculture. We were going out into the world, hunting animals and gathering fruits and vegetables where we found them. So we were uh, foraging and hunting, basically. Then early agriculture, somewhere, as I said, around 10,000 years ago, we started domesticating plants and animals, growing them in one place, having a more regular uh, supply of food. And that went on for, well, probably about 10,000 years. Um, what happened in, what this question? Couldn't a community, whoops, lost the word. I'll come back to this question in a second. I'm just gonna finish up with the history of food systems. I'll come back to the question. So early agriculture is then about domestication. And then around 1700s, 1800s, we started paying more attention to selecting plants for specific, and animals, for specific qualities that we liked. So this is when very early genetic scientists started understanding that if you hybridized plants or if you bred certain plants, you could repeat um, the qualities, you could maintain consistent quality. So you might start breeding apples that were more productive than one breed or another. So it starts being getting into that very early kind of genetic selection and optimization without getting into genetic modification. Um, this was happening way before we were actually able to modify genes directly. Then mechanization, part of industrialization, that would have started with, particularly with petroleum driven machines, uh, that would have started about 100 years ago. And then much more recently, post-World War II, things like synthetic chemical inputs like fertilizers and pesticides and what we call the Green Revolution. Happened. The Green Revolution sounds very positive, but really it was about using a lot more intensive methods, including irrigation and uh, specifically bred seeds and chemical inputs. The Green Revolution started around 1950 uh, particularly in places like Mexico and the Philippines, where uh, a large proportion of the population was still working in farming, and grains like rice and corn were the staple diets. And so in those countries, a lot of American, particularly technologies, were being exported to increase productivity. Okay, I'm going to come back to this question uh, in the chat. Couldn't a community food system at some point consider expanding the business? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. Um, a community food system is really, it's not, it's not a, an organization or a business in itself. A community food system, just going to go back to the slide, is a set of, oh, I see, okay, going live to it. Yeah, well, a community food system, I mean, it depends on the community. It's, it's not actually about uh, business operations. The community food system is a set of considerations. It's a set of, it's a way of thinking about food and agriculture and consumption and fairness and local economies. So you could have a community food system that was a neighborhood where a number of people were growing their own food and sharing it with each other. You could think about a community food system at the scale of a city like Toronto, where different organizations like the Toronto uh, Food Policy Council are trying to make sure that farmers are connecting with consumers and there's a direct relationship. But it's not, food systems, again, are very, they're very amorphous. They're very broad and loose and they're not structured in such a way that you would um, talk about scaling them up. Uh, but yeah, you could have, you could call, well, you couldn't really call Canada's food system a community food system. But the idea with just that term community food system is that it's, it's involving more participation from everybody as opposed to it being basically about production and consumption which is what some food systems tend to look like yeah welcome all right so there's the brief history of food systems that's really about things changing over time we're now looking at the next step in the development of our food systems and that's the big question this is a terrible graphic um, but if you think about Sorry, I'm just going to try to zoom out a bit. No, I'm already zoomed out. Um, so early on, you know what? I'm going to skip over this because it's not going to help you very much. Um, but the the idea with with every evolution in our food systems was trying to solve a previous problem. So moving from let me go back to the previous slide, moving from hunting and gathering into 
agriculture, domesticated agriculture, was about controlling productivity or about trying to ensure a steady supply of food. Then as we moved into hybridization and trait selection, that's about moving from just growing whatever to growing the best versions of those plants and animals. So that was improving quality. Mechanization was about improving volume, increasing productivity, as was the Green Revolution. So as we've moved from one to three, one through five of these different evolutions in the food systems, we're, we're trying to solve for problems. But every time we solve a problem, we also create a problem. Um, and so that's what we're now seeing in this sort of sixth evolution of the food system is we're dealing with all of the issues of non-sustainability that this whole course is about. So the question is what comes next? Um, so here, just to give you a sort of sense of what some of these changes, uh, positive and negative were of our, um, of our various evolutions in the food system. Uh, in this graphic, it's a bit busy, but you can see there are two different types of change. Uh, that are, that, are, that are depicted here. One is the innovations that humans have made, and the other is the effects of those innovations. And there are three different types of change that are being talked about, biochemical, mechanical, and social change. And then those are examples of what change uh, produced what kind of uh, effects. So in terms of biochemical innovation, Things like hybrid seed selection, use of fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. So all those chemicals were produced, but some of the unintended effects, well, some of the effects were increased yields, but also environmental degradation, uh, increased cost for farmers, increased control of pests. In terms of mechanical innovations, things like tractors and everything that is driven by petroleum, um, so those and including transportation, uh, and that was good in some ways because, say, irrigation controlled the water supply and you could grow more food and there was less labor needed. But then there were also problems with this in terms of shifting labor from human beings onto machines. And so that also took away human jobs. Uh, in terms of social innovations, things like land reforms and bank loans and changes in the distribution systems, very positive in terms of getting food out to human beings. Uh, but it also resulted in some problems like the consolidation of farms, so the loss of the individual family farm and it being sold to a corporation and then being having and then create the creation of very, very large industrial scale farms. So there's all these unintended consequences. And even though we were trying to solve for problems that we saw in the, in the food system, then now there are a lot of unintended consequences of the Green Revolution. And those are all of the problems with uh, overproduction and waste and chemical inputs loss of land, loss of small-scale farmers. And I'm going to jump over this one. So a couple of other innovations that are going on right now, um, so in this sixth evolution of the food systems, are things like what we call controlled environment agriculture. And that's just growing food inside greenhouses or some kind of grow room. And that can include hydroponics, which is water-based uh, farming in which there's actually no soil. It's just wa a water, uh, the, the, the roots are hanging in water and the water is filled with different chemical inputs to produce the micronutrients that the plants need to grow on. But that's also things like we see here in the side image right here, which is a vertical farm. And that, those are increasing as we recognize that space is becoming uh, a problem in some of our urban environments. So these are great systems in some ways because you can control the light and the humidity and all these issues. You can use less water, you can produce less waste, you can grow year round if it's a, in a greenhouse. Um, so these are some of the benefits, but then there are also major issues with these kinds of systems, including that they're very expensive to set up because you have to create all that infrastructure and so for an individual or a small scale farm or a family, it's really not accessible because it's just the costs are, are way too much. And the other issue is um, that they're very energy intensive. So these controlled environments need to be kept warm in the winter. They need to have the humidity controlled through uh, fan systems, ventilation systems, not uses electricity. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues with this. One, company in Montreal, it's called Lufa Farms, and they're actually growing 
they have a whole bunch of different uh, controlled environment agriculture facilities. Um, and they're on the roofs of buildings, like large factory buildings in parts of Montreal and elsewhere in Quebec. And so they get the heat from the building and they get the sun, obviously. And they're often using uh, rainwater or snow melt as the, the water that's, of course, filtered. Uh, but so they're using, they're trying to do this kind of controlled environment agriculture, but with less energy input. And it seems to be working pretty well. Um, like they're very busy these days as people are ordering the food online all the time. So in some places, for example, in Holland, uh, as you see here in this information below, the, um, there's a huge amount of agriculture under CEA in Holland, 80% of it. And that's partly because Holland has very, uh, it's, it's a northern country. It has a shorter growing season. It's a, a very low-lying region. That is, it's close to sea level and sometimes below sea level. And it's not a very large country. So in order to produce a lot of food in a small area, they've decided to use this kind of system. I'll jump over this because I want to get onto the idea of a closed loop system. So the linear system is what we what I've talked about when the, the whole the whole course has been about is this problem with um, not understanding that our waste goes into the same environment that our food is coming from. And that's what Annie Leonard is talking about also. Linear systems extract resources and produce products and then forget about the fact that this is all just one closed planet. And so this is really, really destructive because it's it's limiting the number of resources we can take from the environment in the future because we've just dumped all of our garbage everywhere. So if you start thinking in terms of what the slide calls a circular system or more of a closed loop system, um, that's a system that accounts for all the externalities and makes us recognize that the whole thing is closed. We're on a closed planet. There's actually nowhere to put all that garbage except here. So part of what closed loop systems try to deal with is reduction of waste from the very beginning so that we're not like, like for example not wasting fruits and vegetables on the farm by not harvesting those imperfect fruits and vegetables so that's an example of closing the loop in a food system um, and it's very very complicated because of course we're not used to those behaviors we're used to using the environment as our resource and as our dump uh, but we can't keep doing that so this is a challenge we're just not used to it so here you got another graphic that shows the linear materials economy. And this is moving towards this kind of closed loop or what they call a zero waste food system where production actually goes through the same set of cycles as usual, production, distribution, sorry, I'm not drawing properly. So production into distribution, into consumption, and then into disposal, but the disposal doesn't go to the landfill, instead, disposal of our food actually turns into recycling and composting. And that recycled material, so if it's recycled packaging, goes back into production. And compost, which turns into uh, usable fertilizer, also goes into production. And it's not about never extracting anything else again, but about limiting the amount of extraction. So that this still is part of production, but really we're drawing more on the recycled and composted material from our food production system. So super challenging, like I said, just because the systems aren't designed, they weren't set up that way 50 years ago. And so part of what we're trying to do right now with sustainable food systems is not only create this new understanding of them, but create the infrastructure that supports them. And that's where there are huge challenges, but also huge opportunities for all of us um, as we move forward. All right, Dan Barber, we're actually going to look at, uh, this is a really nice uh, TED talk about circular or closed loop systems, but we're going to come back to it at the end because actually it also ties into ethics. And so I want to get on to the ethics uh, chunk of this class. Uh, a few definitions, which I will not go through. I think we've gone through them in detail just right now, but uh, for you to think about and also for your preparation for the final exam, um, you know, food, food systems, closed loop systems talked about those. Unintended consequences, which are outcomes like externality sometimes. And then the Green Revolution, which um, 
which I described as this primary starting in Mexico and Philippines, but also all over the world eventually, uh, starting in the 1950s, and but not really becoming we weren't really becoming aware of it until about a decade or a decade and a half later. And the idea was to increase food production through technologies, through chemical technologies and mechanical technologies. So that's your definition list. Oh, no, more definitions. Um, and these we've also talked about a bit. And anyway, those are just there for you for references and for study practice. Any questions or comments on food systems in this broad sense? Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next presentation, but there's a video to look at first. And again, I will share the link. This is um, this is kind of a I don't know, kind of a weird video. I think it's got a lot of interesting and good content. Uh, and it really comes at ethics um, in terms of an ecological practice. We'll talk a little bit more about ethics in a bit, but first we'll watch this video. And as you're watching it, think about what the video and the people in the video are describing as ethical or eco eating. So I want to come back and ask you if you think that you are an ethical or an eco eater. So the video itself is how long is it? It is six and a half minutes long. So we'll watch it together. There's the link in the chat. And I'm going to turn off my microphone and the video, and we'll be back in seven minutes.
Yeah. Nick, I agree with you that there were no animals harmed when they ate that veggie sandwich. That's that's a bit uh, that sounded a bit more like a guy uh, promoting his restaurant than really talking about the reality. I think it's easy to say that reducing meat is the one big thing we can do. Yeah, it's it's a big thing, but there's an awful lot of other things. So that's why I mean that video is a bit weird. Um, it focuses very much on meat consumption, and certainly meat consumption is amazingly unsustainable for the most part. Now, if you're eating local grass-fed, pasture-raised meat from a farmer that you know is treating his animals ethically, or her animals ethically, um, and you know how that food is produced, you know that it is actually not creating the same kind of carbon footprint. Yes, it's still about uh, grain and feed consumption, and that's a problem. It's still a lot of water consumption to produce an animal, but it's not nearly as bad as <clears throat> eating beef that was grown in the rainforest or grown on deforested land in Brazil. So there's some challenges uh, with the sort of simple statements that are made in that video, but at the same time, it's sort of a, a perspective on on how maybe being ethical is about thinking about some of those questions. So just as by a show of hands, raising your hands, uh, question for all of you, uh, are you an ethical eater, do you think? Who thinks they are an ethical eater? <laughs> no one. <laughs> well, that may be the most honest answer. Um, I think it's, as the video pointed out, which I think is actually one of the really good things, is it is very difficult to be an ethical eater if you are part of a not very ethical food system. And all of us in North America at this point right now are not really part of a very ethical food system. We're very dependent on foreign labor. We're very dependent on foreign production. We're very dependent on petroleum based transportation. We're very dependent on. Um, unsustainably produced meat. We're very dependent on a lot of things that uh, aren't really embedded with ethics. So it's hard to be an ethical eater unless you're producing almost all your own food in an ethical way or participating in some of the more ethical, smaller scale, community-based food systems um, that are starting to exist and that are, that are some of the responses to all of these problems. Um, one of the other questions with ethics is, what does ethics even mean? And so a few definitions here just to, to clarify things, but maybe also won't clear things up because ethics is also kind of based on the context and it changes from time to time. So one of the most honest answers to, are you an ethical eater, might be hmm, sometimes, because indeed um, I can be an ethical eater if I'm presented with ethical options, but I can't be if I'm not. So ethics is overall a system of moral principles. And that's, that's a, again, not exactly an entirely clear explanation because then it depends on what morality is. But these are some of the ways that ethics has been interpreted over time. So a focus on what is considered good according to both individuals and society. So you might say that I've got my own personal ethics, but my society also has a set of ethics. Um, and they may be the same, but they may also be a bit different. Um, so it's a word that comes, ethics itself is a word comes from a Greek word, ethos, which means custom or habit or character or just disposition. So ethics are really tied to what we do um, in this understanding of the word. So here's another set of definitions that may be a bit clearer. A set of moral principles, principles or guidelines, guidelines uh, that govern our conduct, that is how we behave, what we do, either as individuals or as groups. And so this idea that ethics are about guidelines that guide behavior, they're actually not that different from policies, which are a set of written guidelines that are meant to reinforce a certain kind of behavior. And so ethics also may have a kind of uh, requirement that they be reinforced or policed in some ways and that's what society is about society's responses to us as human beings are the ways that they we we police our ethical uh, practices 
And then morals, which is this other word that's based, uh, that ethics is based on, are the principle habits related to right and wrong. So morals are really about what is good and bad, what we should do and what should we should not do. Um, morality is about right and wrong, fundamentally. Um, and it teaches us as we, well, as we learn about morality and ethics, it teaches us how to behave. So then come back to this question, are you an ethical eater? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no, because sometimes I can behave in the ways that support the right thing to do. But sometimes if I'm in a restaurant that doesn't offer any vegetarian options and I can't reduce my meat by eating in that restaurant, but I'm there and I have to be there, <sighs> what do I do? Well, maybe that's where you get stuck because you're part of a system and not entirely independent to make all of your ethical choices whenever you want to. All right, so one of the things about ethics is that it generally applies to human behavior and the relationships that we have with other human beings. But then there's this expansion of uh, the idea of ethics into what we call land ethics. And land ethics are the framework that encompasses how humans and the land or the natural environment should be interacting. Land ethics is it's a new concept, basically, because historically <clears throat> we had pretty simple relationships. We had this relationship between me and you. So that was the social relationship. That's a terrible arrow, sorry. So anyway, there's a relationship between me as an individual and you, and that's a one-to-one -one ethical relationship. Then there's a relationship between me and society, and that's a one-to-many relationship. But then society as a whole and we as individuals also have this relationship with the land, with the environment, with things that live there. And so my relationship with the land is, say I go camping, I'm not gonna burn down the forest. I'm not gonna throw my garbage everywhere. I'm gonna not kill the animals unless I'm going hunting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be responsible and respectful. So that's a kind of my relationship with the land and that's my ethical behavior with the land. But then society also has this requirement to be ethical with the land. And that has to do with more of our collective behaviors and what we allow organizations and corporations and governments to do with our land. So the behavior of, say, a food business or a farm, that's a relationship between a big organization, not an individual like me or you, but a big organization and the land. And then how we allow that organization to interact with the land is a social relationship in terms of land ethics. So we've got <clears throat> multiple different relationships going on in land ethics, which is again, makes it more complicated, makes it more complex. This guy, Aldo Leopold, wrote about uh, this, about land ethics uh, in the 1950s, I believe. And it just, he said, his quote here, which is I think quite effective, down the bottom, the land ethic enlarges the boundaries of the community. So whereas a human or a social ethics involves people, the land ethic is people and the community of soil, water, plant, animals, everything, what he says, the land. It's not just about the physical land, but it's about everything that lives there as well. So this is how we get from land ethics, from, from ethics to land ethics, and then the next step towards food ethics. So there's the, the relation with the land that, we, that uh, Leopold was talking about. But food ethics is then coming back to this relationship to the whole system of food. So that includes land. It also includes the animals, absolutely. And then thinking about the environment more broadly. So land, rivers, lakes, air, oceans. That includes nutrition and the importance of producing food that is good for human bodies when they eat it. And then there are questions about ethics and religious and culture, which we'll get into, and fair trade, which we've also talked about. Social inclusion, which is one of those things that the community food centers deal with, is making sure that people who are otherwise maybe a little bit outside of society don't get left out by the food systems that they're part of. And that also addresses hunger. People should have the right to affordable and culturally appropriate food. So the food ethics gets a lot more complicated than land ethics. And again, it's one of these complex systems. It's very hard to uh, figure out how to solve because there's so many different moving parts. So there's um, a lot of different 
discussion of ethics in a lot of different contexts. We talk about it in society, but ethics also is very much tied to religion and philosophy. And those are two places that we look to sometimes as our guidelines for how to behave in the world and how to be live and do good in the world and be responsible to others. So I've got another quick video. This is uh, a more lighthearted one, but it's about, where is it? There it is. Um, it's about our behavior in the world um, with regard to each other and the land and food and whether or not um, some of those behaviors which seem on the surface pretty good might be a bit more uh, unethical because we're not paying attention to the effects that we're having. So again, I'll drop this in the chat. This is a very short video. It's just over a minute. Uh, so take a look at this uh, for your viewing pleasure, and we will come back in a minute and a half. So maybe that's a lighthearted uh, view of romance and cheesiness. Um, but next time you're going off to buy a bag of Doritos, maybe you can think about that. Is that an ethical choice? Well, every time you eat a bag of tur tur Doritos, sorry, you're also eating a lot of palm oil. Palm oil is grown in large-scale monocultural plantations in the global south including in places like rainforests or places that used to be rainforests that have been deforested in order to, you know, produce this very, very problematic crop for products like, um, <laughs> yeah, I wonder, I think they probably did. I would bet that Doritos is not pleased with that video because it's a pretty, uh, it's pretty cute and then it's pretty scary. So this is this, this is where we get into the question of ethics. No, it's not terrible to eat a bag of Doritos. It is terrible though that Doritos and PepsiCo, the, the parent company, are producing such incredible uh, problems like deforestation. Yeah, I mean, very good point about uh, the components of any given product, because a Dorito is not a thing. It's a highly processed combination of mostly corn, uh, citric acid, and, uh, and palm oil. And each one of those elements is what you have to look at when you're trying to make a sustainable, or in this case, an ethical decision about our food. So again, here's a cue for you for your checklist assignment. When you're thinking about the sustainability of any of your food categories, you also want to be thinking about the components of those different food elements. So some of the foods, like tortillas, are pretty simple because it's what corn, lime, and water. That's a, a fairly simple set of ingredients. But if you're talking about condiments, um, that gets a bit more complicated because they're composed of so many different things. So just, just keep that in mind as you're preparing your checklist is that every product is often made up of many other products. <clears throat> and that comes back to this whole idea about whole foods versus processed foods. Processed foods are harder to be um, ethical about. Uh, I'm going to skip over these next couple of slides, but this is just um, a point about knowledge and ignorance and that basically 
spreading misinformation is in, unethical and that we see that a lot going on right now with with COVID and the different uh, social media that's being put out there really dangerous and and super unethical to support the spread of false or incorrect information um, I'm also going to skip over this well no, I'll explain it very briefly um, there was an an app a uh, telephone a smartphone app that was created to help make ethical decisions when it comes to food purchases. And of course, it didn't work very well because there's so many different elements involved. And actually, if you drill down to what the app was doing, it was only based on what the app developers could understand about food. But really, when they started making the app, they realized, oh no, there's, um, there are way too many issues involved here. And so it's not about a yes or no decision. It's about being a human being who's paying attention to the world, and being an attentive and mindful shopper, and also understanding where food comes from, and understanding that food is made of ingredients, and all of these things. It's just not simple, and apps are fundamentally about simplifying things. So here's a question for you, um, now that we've talked about this a lot. Again, by a show of hands, how many of you think that meeting, sorry, eating meat is unethical? Raise your hand if you think eating meat is unethical. Silence. One. You don't have to. It's really, it, this is really just about what you think is, is ethical, unethical. You know, a lot of vegetarians would say, or vegans also would say, eating meat, eating any animal product, eating any, anim, any product based on animal labor, unethical. All right, so a couple of you said that it's unethical to eat meat and the rest of you do not. So let's look at a couple of pieces of messaging about eating meat. Now this is not, again, a very good quality slide, but you can see the question, why do you love one of these animals and eat the other? Ha ha. Here's another slide. If vegetarians love animals so much, why do they eat all their food? Hmm. And Yes, well, you can eat, yes, you can eat something you love. Um, and then this is the uh, another slide. Uh, what does it say? Tell me again how we are designed to eat meat. So there's a human mouth with uh, teeth that look more like a vegan's teeth there versus the omnivore's teeth or the carnivore's teeth. So these are three different slides portraying three different messages, one being about physiology defining whether or not we should eat meat one being kind of ironic and goofy like why are we eating all the food of all the animals that eat vegetables and one of them being kind of playing with our emotions oh the cute puppy i'd never eat the cute puppy but the cute piggy i would definitely eat the cute piggy and so yeah so definitely because these things have entered into the food chain dogs for the most there are some some places that still eat dog occasionally and cats and all sorts of other things insects um but there are lots of places where dog meat just isn't part of the food chain sure but it's also there are more complicated reasons behind all this um <clears throat> so then here's another question if pesticides are used to kill insects on plants is it ethical because insects are animals, is it ethical to be a vegetarian who eats food that is produced with pesticides? Or do you have to say, okay, if I'm going to be an ethical vegetarian, I will only eat, um, I will only eat organic food that has never had pesticides? There's a question. Like it's a legitimate question, and it's about this: where does our ethics end? Where do we stop considering? For example, a living creature <clears throat> to be a plant or an animal. In this case, insects are animals, but they're not kinds of animals that we generally think about treating with respect. So coming back to what it means for you, <clears throat> excuse me, as a, as a future sustainable food professional, um, is all these questions. Are you paying your staff well? Are you treating their labor as valuable? 
Are you being an obnoxious jerk in the kitchen and yelling at your cooks? Do you feed your staff some terrible staff lunch or are you giving them really high quality food? Then for your consumers, do you have vegan options? Do you allow your food system to allow others to make ethical or at least vegetarian vegan decisions? Do you ask your suppliers to reduce their waste? Are you acting to increase sustainability across your larger food system? This is a big question. Let's skip over this one and this one and this one. Actually, this one. Um, this is because mostly about ethics are just super challenging. Um, the, the big question, though, that ethics often comes back to is how animals are treated when, uh, when they're part of a food production system and how complicated it is to replace meat with other options because meat throughout our history and into our future will always be attached to power and privilege and class. Um, historically, it was the upper classes who could afford to buy meat. Meat was always attached to upper class society, wealthier classes. And even, you know, so today, even those of us who are in the middle class still take a certain amount of prestige out of eating meat. And this is why fast food hamburgers, particularly real meat burgers, are such an important part of our culture because it's a way to eat meat but without paying a lot of money. So it makes meat much more widely accessible. But it's not good meat, it's not ethical meat. It's just that, that symbolic importance is now accessible to a much larger number of people than it used to be in history. So some of the responses, what, meatless Mondays? Go one day a week without eating meat. Um, I often don't eat meat for four or five days in a row, and I very rarely eat uh, just a big old steak, but occasionally I, that's exactly what I want. And so you can be ethical by reducing your consumption. You don't have to cut it out altogether. You can be more ethical by buying meat from a butcher that you know who has sourced his animals ethically and is buying from a farmer who's growing their cows and chickens and pigs in ways that are treating the animals with respect and treating the land with respect. Um, and then you can also think about just not eating meat at all, but eating meat alternatives. And so now there are tons of meat alternatives on the market. Uh, do I have examples here? No, I don't. But we know about uh, the fast food meats. We know about Beyond Meat and uh, whatever the other one's called. And there's different kinds of actual animal tissue that's being grown now, um, which is not yet available on the market, but what we call clean meat or meat that is grown in sort of a lab, uh, grown in a context where there's no animal, just the flesh of an animal being grown um, in a much more highly technologized situation. So that's, you know, maybe a future. We will see in the next decades whether or not that kind of meat becomes popular. For the time being, because it's not growing on an animal, the texture is very different. So it's sort of, it's like protein tissue. Um, and it may have some fat and some flavor, but it doesn't have much texture. And this is the real issue right now for a lot of that, um, what we call clean meat. <clears throat> so the other direction that a lot of people are going is eating, um, again, a terrible slide, but eating uh, insects. And one of the reasons is that you get a lot more protein, uh, a lot less fat, uh, it's a lot less water used. It's a very high fee conversion ratio for crickets particularly, but all sorts of different insects are eaten by all sorts of people around the world. Um, this slide, which you can't read very well, says that 80% of countries and 2.5 billion people, so about a third of the population around the world, already eats insects on a regular basis. Um, and some of us may think it's normal, some of us may, may think it's weird, but it is uh, a direction that a lot of ethical thinkers and ethical food people are moving in is to start thinking about <clears throat> replacing some of our proteins with uh, insect-based proteins. And this is a question that it may be successful and we will wait and see. For now, I think it's a really good direction. There are a lot of, I've seen a lot of protein bars that are made with cricket flour and things. Um, and indeed, this is this is one of the one of the ways that what's this company, Next Millennium Farms, is promoting the consumption of 
there's Next Millennium Farms promoting the consumption of cricket flour because it's high in protein and amino acids and iron and calcium and it's good for the planet and it doesn't taste that different from uh, soy meal powder. Uh, and then Entomo Farms, and there's a link here, and this would be maybe worth checking out if you're thinking about a taco truck who wants to serve crickets in their tacos. Entomo Farms is a very large scale producer of crickets in uh, Ontario. And they're actually the number one, or the number, or the, the biggest uh, insect farm in North America right now. All right, a few other details here, which uh, I'll just go over relatively quickly. As I mentioned, that ethics is often very attached to culture and religion. Um, there are diets that are based on ethical choices sometimes. There are religious diets in particular that are based on ethics. And questions of what is ethical, what is uh, some people would refer to as appropriate or fit for a given diet. In Judaism, for example, the word kosher just means fit. Some people think it means clean. It has nothing to do with cleanliness, um, but it has to do with what is what is considered appropriate to eat. And lots of different religions uh, will not eat certain foods because they consider it uh, forbidden or not fit or not appropriate, not ethical, not moral. Another slide that you absolutely can't read, but in the, uh, the ones that are online, you'll be able to read this. Uh, this is a slide that talks about the myths about business ethics, and these have to do with things like you can't you can't be ethical with, and make a profit. That's a myth. You can actually. So these are worth looking at um, again for your checklist assignment. They may give you some guidance when it comes to identifying your criteria for sustainable for sustainability. And then the last couple of slides are, again, some useful tools for your checklist to take a look at. Um, these are questions that may become the tools that you use to build that checklist, um, including questions that you can ask other people in, as a food business owner. So what did your farmers use in terms of agricultural practice? Uh, were the animals treated humanely? Did they live in good lives? Were the vegetables grown from heirloom seeds or were they grown from seeds that came from a big seed company like Monsanto? Uh, how far did this food travel? These are all good questions for an ethical chef, but also for a sustainable chef because ethics and sustainability um, are connected. Other questions. How about the people? How were they treated? That's a question of social sustainability. Um, were they being paid properly? That's an economic sustainability question. Did the food get certified in some way? Is a certification of organic good? Is fair trade good? Do you want this to be part of your ethical and sustainable food practice? And then other questions that you may want to ask, and that could actually also be part of your checklist, are, is, is the farm open to people coming and visiting? Do they keep their practices transparent? Are they showing what they do in terms of sustainability, or are they uh, hiding certain practices. So those are also questions of sustainability, transparency being one of the keys there. So those are just a, a bunch of questions. Go back to read those when you're preparing your checklist because again, they might give you useful cues for preparing that assignment. Um, so I'm gonna do, actually, you know what? I'm gonna save the video for next week because uh, I thought, it might tie in well here, but I think it'll tie in better to next week's discussion. Um, it'll also be a break from our exam review, but I'm gonna show you some cheerful, positive, and hopeful examples of sustainability in next week's class, as well as going through um, some exam review. So as the last thing for today's class, um, I'm gonna ask you to, um, over the, the rest of the day, very quickly, again, a not, a, not a, a long exercise. It should take 10 minutes maximum. Don't take longer than that. And I'm gonna ask you to draw your current food ecology. I'll explain what I mean by that. Actually, I'm gonna, well, no, I'll, I'll show you first what I mean by that and then show you some examples. All right, nobody, nobody draw, I'm gonna draw. Um, so, 
what I want you to do with this assignment is think about what's changed in your personal food system, in your what I would call a food ecology. You, your habits, where you're going shopping, if you're going outside, if you're not going outside, uh, what your fridge looks like, what kind of dishes you're making for yourself right now, what you have access to, what you don't have access to, the kinds of transportation you're using. So it's all of these things that are associated with the way you eat. So that's your personal food ecology. So in that sense, I might put, you know, if I was drawing my personal food ecology, I might put myself here in the middle. A hat on, because I always wear a hat. Um, so that's me. Now I start thinking about the spaces that I am going to. Well, I do go to a grocery store once a week. So there's my grocery store. And oh, and there's a bakery not far from me where I am buying a couple of loaves of bread every three weeks. I don't eat a lot of bread, so I'm just going there less often. So I go there once a week. I go there once every three weeks. Uh, what else is in my life right now? Oh, the liquor store, because I need my wine. So in Quebec, it's called the SAQ. This might be the LCBO. This is a very slow way of drawing. All right, so these are, these are the places that I'm going to. Right? Those are my retail ecologies. What have I got going on inside my, my, own, my own apartment? is very different than it used to be. It's much fuller of food because I'm buying much less often. So I actually got a lot of stuff stored in my house right now. I actually did my, I do my budget every month. And last month I spent like $350 more on food than I usually do. Not because I ate more, but because I just brought more into my house in preparation for what's going on right now. So my, my apartment is actually really full of food right now. It's full of all sorts of things. But I've also, as I showed you at the beginning of the class, I started that bread. So I've got my bread dough going. What else is happening right now? I've got, uh, I'm on Zoom quite often on my computer. So this is me being a bit silly, but I'm showing you what I'm trying to do is I'm often on Zoom in the evenings with friends having a cocktail. That's my martini. So that's a new thing for me. I wasn't that wasn't part of my food ecology before. Um, I'm not going to the restaurants that I used to go to. I'm not going out to bars. I'm not going out to see friends. I'm not having dinner parties. So that's not part of my life anymore. So what I want you to do, and you can then you can label these things, right? E. Grocery store. Um, bakery. Mm, cocktails. All right. But I've just done four or five things. I'd like you to fill up a page, and you can do this on a computer or on a piece of paper. Fill up a page and just think about all of the ways that you're interacting with food right now, and include particularly all of the things that you aren't doing anymore. So all of those things that are not part of your life, have them be part of this image, but maybe set off to one side. And again, you can label them. So what I want you to do is reflect on how your food system, how your personal food system, how your food ecology has changed since before COVID and now in the period that we're all isolating and, and changing our behaviors. Because a lot is changing and we may not be aware of it. So this is kind of a reflection exercise but also a chance for you to think about what parts of your food world are no longer what things that you're doing actively right now. And also what you might change afterwards, what you might stop doing or what you, you might start doing again. Uh, is that clear or is that not clear? Does anyone have any questions about this little assignment? I'm going to ask you to do it between now and the end of the day. Um, you know, don't take a lot of time to do it. I just did this in whatever it was, three minutes. I can imagine you doing it in about 10 minutes. You can do it on paper, you can do it on screen, and then just send me either a photograph of the paper or a scan if you've got a scanner, 
Um, you can just take a picture with your smartphone or draw it out on a piece of paper or draw it out electronically and then send me the JPEG or a PDF of it. Uh, again, you can just send it by email um, and you've got until the end of the day. So whenever your day ends, send it off to me. Don't stress about it. It's just a, it's more of a reflection exercise. It's certainly not an exercise in being artistic. If you take my example, um, don't worry about drawing beautifully. Just make it clear so that I can understand what the different parts are. And yeah, so basically you're including everything in the image that is part of your personal food system. So it could be the places you go shopping and things, but also the things that you do. So the foods that you cook and eat for yourself. Or like I said, um, you know, the new habits that you have acquired, like having cocktail parties online with your friends or making bread from a sourdough starter or filling up your house with a lot of food. And then also include all the things that you're not doing anymore. So over here, this was my example of I'm not having dinner parties. Yeah, I'll explain it again. I'm not having dinner parties. I'm not going out to all the restaurants and bars that I used to go to. I'm not seeing my friends. So all of these things that I'm not doing that are no longer part of my food system. Well, it's drawing where you go, but it's also drawing what you do. So um, I go and I don't go to some places. In my house, I've got a fridge that's very full of food, so I'm putting that in my ecology. Uh, I am spending more time online, so I'm putting that in my ecology. So it's really just trying to think about you and your personal food life right now and all of the different pieces of it and really the difference now versus before we were in isolation. So what has changed about your food ecology is part of the question as well. I, For example, I used to maybe go to the liquor store once a week because I'd be buying wine to go out to a dinner party with friends. I haven't been there now in about three weeks because I stocked up and I brought some wine home to my house and so I, I just don't go out to there every day. So that's changed, that's a difference. Um, like I said, I go to the grocery store once a week instead of four or five times a week. I, I'm doing different things. So the ecology is about, I will write this down, Out, you do. Yeah, it's all about food, and it's all about what you are now doing that is different, where you are now going or not going that is different. What has changed basically between now, in isolation, reducing our movements, maybe increasing our home cooking, reducing our fast food eating, maybe increasing our fast food eating. Maybe you're ordering out a lot more than you used to. Maybe you're ordering groceries online and you never used to do that. Maybe you're sharing food with your neighbor because you know how to make bread and they know how to make peanut butter. I don't know. So what's changed between three weeks ago and now and make uh, a drawing of it that shows that in some way. Any other questions? Okay. And again, it's not uh, not meant to be like a super complicated thing. This is just one more one of these extra exercises that we've added to replace the pledge assignment. Um, Great, you got it then, Sudip, good. And I will also post this video online. Uh, so it'll take, it took about three hours last time for the video to process on YouTube. So it'll probably be posted by tomorrow morning. Um, I will also put an announcement uh, on Blackboard about something for next week, so our final exercise for next week. But I'll explain it again right now. And it's very simple. Uh, I'm gonna ask you, to, so for next week, I'm gonna just close this, sorry. So for next week, 
because next week is um, we're going to do a review for the exam. Everybody who comes to class needs to submit to me uh, two ideas that they would like to have explained in class. Yeah, you can send it by email. Uh, I'll also accept it in chat the day of. But just I want you to send me or bring with you to class <clears throat> two ideas or questions or concepts or definitions that you want more explanation about. And so that'll be a chance for us all to share questions together, and then I'll respond to those questions so that it, that'll be part of the exam review. But <clears throat> that's going to be your final exercise for this class, is just to come prepared to the class with two, could even be three things that you're not sure about, that you want some more explanation about, uh, that you want me to review in preparation for the exam. The exam will be short answer questions and some multiple choice. It'll be um, pretty straightforward. Uh, but not and it'll only take about an hour to do for the most part and then yeah for this drawing exercise <coughs> excuse me <coughs> for the drawing exercise i can't speak i <coughs> want you to send me either a photograph or a jpeg or a pdf of your illustration send it to me by email all right. Any other questions? Okay, doke. Okay. Um, I will go into the other room on Blackboard. I'll be shutting this room down so the recording can stop and get processed. But I'll be in the course room for about 15 minutes after this class. So if you have any other questions you want to pose privately, come meet me in there. And if you have any other questions at all about uh, today or the assignments or what you're supposed to do for next week, let me know. And I will, again, I'll post these things in the Blackboard announcements, so keep an eye on that. And that's it for today. Thank you for being here. And see you online next week or somewhere else. Take care, everyone. Be well. Be safe. Be sane. Eat well, buy some milk for your cereal. <laughs>